isn't it? Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Acts chapter 5, verse 17 tonight. And uh, we'll continue to talk about being unhindered. This is a series I uh, preached at Hopewell at the beginning of the year. And uh, I'm not going to do the whole series here in a couple of days. I'm not going to try to do that to you, but uh, try to pick out some things that I think the Lord wants us to talk about. And uh, Sunday, Sunday we talked about what's the biggest thing hindering you from going all in with and all out for Jesus. And uh, I had a three by five card. We handed those cards out and asked you to write one of those things down. And, and if you weren't here Sunday, I would challenge you to pray, think along those kind of lines as we do revival tonight and ask the Lord, what's the biggest thing hindering me? Because here's the thing, here's the thing. As you turn to Acts chapter five, how will we know if we had revival? You know, a lot of times people say, oh, we had a great revival. I felt so close to the Lord. And I sure hope you feel close to the Lord. I felt close to the Lord so far this week. I hope you have. Um, sometimes we talk about how many people were there, if we had some visitors and things like that. But really, you look about three months from now, and you look at that card and what you wrote down, and it gives you a pretty good idea if you had revival or not. Did God do anything in your life, or other than feelings, and other than seeing people here? Maybe some people came that, that you were real excited that they were here. And I'm for all of that. I, I love all of that, okay? But that is not an indicator of did we do business with God? Did God really minister uh, to our hearts? So I would encourage you uh, to keep that card in your Bible. Um, the rest of the week, maybe for two or three weeks, maybe a couple of months, uh, wherever you have your quiet time, and just every once in a while, take a glance at it and see if the Holy Spirit's not doing something. And I say that by way of encouragement, by way of encouragement, to see if you can see some real spiritual growth uh, in your life. So we talked about last night, unhindered from complacency, and... Um, um, so look at tonight, and go, say, go back to Acts chapter 5 tonight, these apostles, and see how the Holy Spirit is setting them free. It's a wonderful thing to watch if you look in the book of Acts. At the very beginning, they're hindered by fear, they're hindered by uncertainty, they're hindered by doubt, all kind of things. And the last verse in the uh, New International Version, it says, And Paul is teaching and preaching the kingdom of God without hindrance. And uh, don't you want to move that direction tonight, to live all in and all, all out with, for Jesus without any hindrance. We'll look at Acts chapter 5, verse 17 tonight. The Bible says, now, this is right on the heels of what we talked about last night. Um, God's doing some tremendous miracles and things. I mean, man, verse 15, they were even trying to just let Peter's shadow fall on them. Dude, now, it doesn't actually say they were healed. The imp implication is they were healed if his shadow fell on them. Your shadow's falling on somebody and they're getting healed. Something's going on now. <laughs> All right? That's how that you bore right there. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Verse 7 says, so good stuff going on. Verse 17, but the high priest rose up along with all his associates. That is the sect of the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees... Uh, see, the Pharisees were kind of more like us. The Pharisees were, they studied the Bible. They were theologically conservative, okay? They believed the Bible. They were kind of, they kind of studied the Bible very, very diligently. Now, we, they get a bad rap because some of them were hypocrites and, and all of that. But at their best, we have a lot more in, in, in common with the Pharisees than we do the Sadducees. The Sadducees were theologically liberal, didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead, didn't believe in angels, didn't believe in a uh, more conservative approach to God's word. In other words, take it very, very seriously like, like we do. So the, the Sadducees were richer. They were usually the ones in, in charge. They, they were more of the high priest kind of thing. So that's who we're dealing with, the Sadducees. And they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles. That is not an ordination sermon right there, okay? and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, Go, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council, that's the Sanhedrin, they called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought out. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison. And they returned and reported back, saying, we, we found the prison house locked securely, the guards standing at the doors, but when we had opened up, we found the body inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of them. 
of what will come of this. But someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. Well, we all have things that we're concerned about and things that trouble us a little bit, right? Heard about uh, Sunday morning preacher preached and a uh, guy in the church named Bubba. Bubba, was kind of, Bubba wasn't there a whole lot, kind of a visitor around town. And so Bubba came forward and, and uh, asked the pastor, he said, uh, Pastor, I want you to pray for my hearing. And so their pastor is kind of like your pastor. He believes in prayer. And so he put his hands over, over Bubba's ears, and, and he prayed fervently uh, for Bubba's hearing. And when he got finished praying, he said, well, Bubba, how's your hearing now? He said, don't know. It ain't till next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and that fella has something to be concerned about, didn't he? <laughs> Absolutely has something to be concerned about. Well, here's the thing tonight. Uh, we all have something to be concerned about, and I want to talk specifically tonight about being unhindered from fear. I want to talk about being unhindered from fear tonight. I'm not talking about, um, you know, general fears like you're afraid of something happened to your loved one, you're afraid you might be sick and not know. I'm not talking about those kinds of fears. I'm talking specifically tonight about fears that keep us from obeying the Lord. Okay, fears that keep us from going all in with and all out for Jesus. Okay, See, it really, it's a sin that hinders us from really being what God wants us to be. That's the kind of fear I'm talking about. Okay, those other fears are important. Those other fears are, are, are God concerned about those, and God has something to say to you about those. But tonight, I'm talking about those fears that hinder us from walking close to Jesus. And as we think about that tonight, here's what we all know: if we let fear control us we will be hindered. If we let our fears get the best of us, and if we let fears control our behaviors and control what we say and how we act, then we are not going to be what God wants us to be. We're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be bearing fruit like we want to. We're not going to be the kind of church that God wants us to be. And so I want us to talk about that tonight because fear uh, can absolutely paralyze people. And if we're not careful, we get used to it. Well, I'm afraid of praying out loud, or I'm afraid of sharing my faith, or I'm afraid of saying the name of Jesus somewhere. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of, uh, of asking somebody to pray for me. Anyone, whatever these fears are, if we're not careful, we live in a long time and we forget, it's not okay. The fact that you're afraid of something and, and it causes you to disobey God, uh, you might get kind of okay with that. God's not okay with it. And so tonight, I'm praying that God would sort of stir us up a little bit and remind us to put his finger on some things. And I want to challenge you as I preach tonight. You're talking to the Holy Spirit saying, show me, if there's a fear that's hindering me, would you show me what it is? And Lord, tonight, I want to put that thing down. I don't want to let some stinking fear rob me of the joy in Christ and rob you of the glory that you should rightfully have in my life. Now, as I said a minute ago, I did this series in, um, at Hopewell in January, started in January, and did the same thing with them I did with you. I asked them to fill out a card and told them they didn't mind me looking at it, write down that biggest thing, lay it on the altar that Sunday, and a bunch of people did. Uh, complacency was one of the biggest ones, and fear was one of the other ones. That was two of the top three things that we had that people said, this is the biggest thing getting in my way. And I'll be honest with you, it's one that I battle have battled it. Uh, really, I, I've always been um, uh, introverted. Uh, I've always been quiet, always been kind of pretty shy, that kind of thing. And so fear of speaking up, speaking out, being seen, always been kind of a big deal for me. In fact, in fact, when I was in the fifth grade, uh, we had to give an oral report. And the teacher said that you can use some imagination with your report, okay? And so we had to stand in front of class and, and give a report. It scared me to death. Some of my most fervent praying in school was that the bell would ring before I had to give it a report in front of the whole class, okay? And so I, um, I was not says a lot about my prayer life. I wasn't saved I was 17, so that's an unsaved man praying. But anyway, the teacher had a little, you know, a, I don't guess you call it a pulpit in school. What do you call it in school? Podium, thank you. I know how to school teacher here. So you got a podium there. Hers was a little bit bigger than this and it had a pretty good sized cabinet for my oral report. 
I got inside the podium, and I did it as a radio broadcast. <laughs> That's how I did my oral report. And uh, so the teacher got up. We dressed up. And a buddy of mine was with me. We got two of us in the podium, <laughs> okay? And so we dressed in front of the podium up, and she turned it on, and we went, <laughs> Why well, she turned channels, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That's how we did. So it's always been that way. When I got saved, the night I got saved, lady giving her testimony, and um, somebody told me, she said, you ought to get her to sign your Bible. And that's, that's always been a little bit odd to me. But anyway, I did. And she wrote Isaiah 41.10 in my Bible. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And time after time after time, I've went back to that verse. Somebody said there are 365 fear nots in the Bible. I don't think there's that many because I've looked. <laughs> I can find about 50 to 75. That's still a lot, right? Still a lot. So there's a lot of fear nots in the Bible. Why does God say fear not so much? Because he knew we'd have a problem with it. We knew He knew we'd have some situations where we needed that. God's word to you tonight is don't let fear control your life. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is not of God. Okay? Now, we're supposed to fear God, but that's not a cowering fear that causes us to run away. That's a loving fear that causes us to run to Him, not away from Him. God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. That's what God wants you to have uh, tonight. So, uh, just to recap, so we kind of get an idea of what's going on here. These guys, God's been doing a great thing. Uh, they get put in prison, uh, arrested by the same people that killed Jesus. They arrest these guys while they're in prison during the night. The angel of the Lord sets them free. Now, Peter and John were arrested back in Acts 4. This is all 12 of them being arrested now. Peter's going to be arrested in Acts chapter 12. So these guys are going to prison every once in a while. So they're in prison. They get set free. Now, the, they're in prison because they're preaching at the temple. They're preaching and teaching the word of God. And so they, they, the, the, the angel gets them out and says, now, go preach, go teach. And at daybreak. They're in the temple preaching and teaching this very same thing that got them thrown in jail. And then they go and try to get them out of jail, but they're not there anymore. They rearrest them, bring them back, command them not to do it anymore, beat them, okay? Beat them, turn them loose, and they go off rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. That's pretty good stuff. And then verse 42 says, and they kept on teaching and preaching Jesus is the Christ. So I want to take that and go three things, three things that help us be uh, uh, unhindered from fear tonight. Number one, recognize the object of your fear. Recognize the object of the fear. Let me ask you, what keeps you? What is the, because here's the thing. If you can nail it down and say, this is the deal, okay, then you got something to pray about. That's why whenever I share my faith, if somebody says, um, I don't want to give my, if I say, would you like to give your life to Christ now? And they say, no, I will typically say, thank you for your honesty. Because a lot of people won't be honest. A lot of people will just say, well, I'm already a Christian, even if they're not. And so I thank them and say, thank you for your honesty. If you wouldn't mind me asking you one more question, and then we will we'll talk about something else. Um, would you mind telling me why you would want to give your life to Jesus tonight? And that way, if they say, well, I don't believe Jesus really rose from the dead. That's one thing I can pray for. Or if they say, I don't think I'm good enough, well, I can answer that for them. Okay, we can deal with that and help them with that. And so sometimes it's helpful to know what the fear is. So I identify your fears. So let me just mention a couple. You think about this and see if this might be yours. What other people think? It's huge. It's amazing how big that is. Uh, whenever I talk in our Sunday school, I teach a young adult Sunday school class because I like being in the young adult class. <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> but I teach the young adult class, and a lot of times I'll say, you know, what's the biggest hint? And, and so many times it's what other people think. I've actually had someone say, you know, and you can use this about anything. I'm, I'm just going to use an example. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do I'm just giving you an example. I had one guy say... You know, sometimes in church I feel led to put my hand up when we're singing, but I'm not going to do it because I'm scared of what somebody else might think. You're going to disobey the God of heaven who let his son hang on a cross because you're not going to raise your hand because you're afraid of what somebody else might think. 
this is huge. It's one of the biggest things. I believe why people don't share their faith, why they don't ask for prayer requests. Why. See, if somebody says, if Brian came up to me at Walmart tomorrow and said, uh, Barry, would you pray for me? I've got this situation, and I'd love for you to pray for me. I'm probably going to say, Brian, would you mind if we prayed right now? For two reasons. One is, if I don't, I'm liable to lie to him because I say I will, and that's one of the biggest lies Christians tell. I'm praying for you. That's not a saying, that's a promise, okay? And so I'm going to pray right then if I can. And the other thing, I know, I know for myself, if you pray for me out loud what I ask you to, that's meaningful to me. What's the drawback? What's the whole, why wouldn't you do that? Well, you're afraid of what somebody else might think, what somebody else might say. What are they thinking about me? Let me give you something to help you a little bit. They ain't thinking about you. <laughs> thinking about them, <laughs> okay? You go to Walmart and you're worried what somebody thinks about your shirt and your makeup. They don't care. They think about what you think about their makeup and their shirt, whatever. So we got to get to the point where we va truly value what God thinks over what somebody else thinks. We might also might be afraid of what might happen. We might be afraid of, of uh, how much it costs. It might cost you something. You might, it might cost you something. You might ask to pray for somebody. I've been in the hospital rooms not very many times, two or three times, when I said, hey, would you mind if I prayed for you? And they said, I'd rather you not. What's well, all right. I said, well, I appreciate you being honest with me. And, I'll, I'll, you know, if you don't mind, I'll pray for you when I get home tonight. But I sure hope you get better. And I don't say that smart aleck or anything. I'm not trying to put them in their place. If they don't want me to, then that's, that's their right. But, but I'm not going to be smart aleck, but I do care about them, okay? What might happen? A lot of people say, well, you know, I would talk more about Christ or I'd share my faith more, but I just don't think I know enough. That is not a valid excuse. It doesn't wash. And now I'm going to tell you why, and I hope this helps a little bit. Here's the thing. If they ask you a question that you don't know, that actually is a pretty good thing to happen. And here's why. First of all, you know how you got saved. If you know how you got saved, you can tell them how to get saved. And, and so you know enough, okay? You, you can just share your story. And, um, and, and, and if you don't know any more than that... Brother John would be glad to help you with that. But here's the thing. If they say, well, you know, Brother Barry, what about, you know, something about this? And I, I don't know about it. What about Noah's Ark or something? How to get all the animals on? Something like that. Here's what I say. That's a great question. I don't really know the answer to that. Now, here's what you've done. Number one, you've been honest. Number two, you have shown respect to them. You've respected them. It's a great question. I don't know. The, and I'm not going to blow smoke out. I, I don't know the answer to that. But I tell you what. I'm going to try to find it out, and uh, when I find it out, can I get back with you and, and share with you what I find out? So here's what's happened. They feel kind of good about the conversation, okay? They, they've asked you something you didn't know, so they kind of feel good about that. Secondly, you've got an end to talk to them again. Okay, so it's a win-win for you because then you can go back and say a week later, you see them somewhere, you call them up, you say, man, they made a good question. You ask me, uh, look, I've been doing some research, talked to a couple of folks. Here's what I found out. And then you can say, and by the way, you know, that was a really good question. And I've got a good question I want to ask you. You know, what I was really trying to say was I'm concerned about you and I love you. And I want to know that you really know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Do, do, do you know Christ as your Can I help you uh, with that kind of thing? And so you got something to deal with. I think a lot of times when we say, I'm afraid somebody might ask me something I don't know, I think that's pride hiding behind there. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to look silly. I don't want to be shown up. Well, just lose that, okay? Pride's one of those seven things that God hates, so just kind of get over that one, okay? I may have to give up too much. Um, uh, letting God have control of my life is a little bit scary. All that kind of stuff, okay? What is your fear that you're going to lay down tonight? I'm not asking you just to identify it. I'm saying know what it is. What is the object? And what's it keeping you from? Is that fear keeping you from sharing your faith? Is it keeping you from praying with your family? Is it keeping you from standing up for Jesus at school or at work? Is it keeping you from saying I love you to a family member somewhere or another? Here's the thing, guys. These guys were arrested. They were put in prison. And then they were told to go back out and teach again in the name of Jesus. And here's a question for you. I don't have the answer to this question. I want you to think about it for a moment. When they went back out at daybreak the next day and they started teaching, I wonder if they felt afraid. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they'd seen Jesus alive and all that. I think they probably were. I would have been. 
<laughs> okay? And here's what I want, here's what I want, here's the thing about that. If you feel afraid, that's okay. Just don't let the fear dictate what you do. Feeling afraid is not the same as giving in to fear. If you feel afraid and obey God and whatever it was he's calling you to do, then, guys, that's obedience. You can lay down at night and say, yeah, I did what God wanted me to do. Don't let fear dictate what you do and dictate what you say. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 26. Acts chapter 5, verse 26. And then the captain went along with officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. Here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. Everybody has something to be afraid of. And people that don't know Jesus have something to be afraid of as well. What if we're right? What if you die? And Jesus really is the truth. And Jesus really is the way. Jesus really is the only way to the Father. What if the joy we talk about, we really have? What if the marriage that I say that Jesus has given Laura and I, what if we really have that? What if by choosing to disobey God and not giving your life to Christ, what if you really are missing out on the most important thing in the entire universe? And if you're here tonight, you've never been saved. That's something I would encourage you to think about. If you're letting fear keep you from being saved, and it kept me from being saved. God, I was raised in a church, First Baptist of Baker, Louisiana. As I said, very shy, very introverted. Uh, we had about five to 600 people there on a Sunday morning. And, and I associated, and this is not necessarily true, I associated being saved with walking down in front of all those people and telling them that I got saved. Now, you do need to make it public. Uh, it's not the same thing, but that just scared me to death. Okay, and that was and fear kept me out of that. But here's the thing, guys, don't let fear rob you of your eternity with God. Don't let it buffalo you in that direction. Uh, so you see, part of the fear is we ought to be fe- afraid of missing out what God has for us. It's one of Laura's biggest fears. One of Laura's biggest fears other than dirt cheap having a buggy sale and she's not there. <laughs> My wife is a huge dirt cheap fan. She actually has the Dirt Cheap t-shirt. She was one of the first 200 in line when they first opened up in Andalusia. And Hannah Grace has threatened her if she ever wears that in public that it's going to be bad in our house. She cannot wear it in public. And, uh, but one of the things that Laura says, she says, you know, I'm afraid that I'm going to get to heaven. And there's going to be this big room of unclaimed blessings that God had for me. And I didn't either didn't ask for them or I didn't obey God and get them. And that really ought to be more, that really ought to be something, not, not a bad fear, but that ought to be something to motivate us to say, I'm not going to let my fear, I'm not going to let what somebody else thinks, somebody else says, what might happen, I'm not going to let that rob me of some of the best blessings God has. Because here's what I know, for me, the things that I've been most afraid of, that I chose to obey God anyway in, are some of the biggest blessings of my entire life. Second thing, number one, uh, what it, realize the object. Secondly, resolve to obey. Resolve to it. Resolve in your heart to say, okay, I feel afraid, makes me nervous, gives me some anxiety, that kind of thing. But I'm going to resolve not to let the fear dictate, but I'm going to let the Holy Spirit. Spirit dictate my life. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, it's been about three or four months ago now. He's 86 years old. He was an engineer, I think it was at Auburn. He was an engineering major in Auburn. And uh, he felt like God called him to preach. And so, um, and he had good grades and all of that. So he went into his uh, advisor and uh, it might not have been Auburn, I think it was. But anyway, he went into, it's a big university, doing very well in engineering. He's a very smart guy. And he went into his advisor and he said, um, God's called me to preach and I'm going to, I'm going to resign from the university. I'm going to go to Sanford and, and pursue a ministry and um, a ministry degree. And the guy said, you're making a huge mistake. You've got great grades. We've got a job lined up for you. You can start working next semester on kind of work study program. And, uh, and you're gonna, you've got a great career. And he just almost begged, don't give it up. Don't give it up. And I asked him, I said, what do you think about that now? He said, I wouldn't go back. He, he did. He resigned from, from the university, went to Sanford, been in ministry. He's retired from ministry now. He said, I wouldn't go back and change it for any amount of money in the world. 
the joys I have had in serving God and his people, I wouldn't trade for anything. That's where I'm at tonight. Don't let fear rob you of some of the best blessings of God. Don't get to the end of the day or the end of your life or the end of your uh, your raising your children or end of your grandchildren's uh, moving out to be on their own. Don't get to the end of that and say, man, I wish I hadn't missed out on that. I missed out on that because I was afraid of what might happen. Or See, here's the thing. Am I going to be okay with disobeying God or obeying God? There's a guy that I really, 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 really like. His name is uh, Arthur Blessed. Uh, if, you, if you don't know if you've ever heard of Arthur Blessed. Arthur Blessed is in like 78, 79 years old. Uh, when he was um, a young man, he was living in California on Sunset Strip, out, out Christian for Jesus. And he felt like God told him to carry a cross across the United States. He had a big 12-foot cross. He had a coffee shop uh, for Jesus kind of a thing. And uh, felt like God called him to, call that, uh, to carry that across the United States, which he did. And then he felt like God called him to carry it around the world. And this guy has been carrying the cross. He's retired now. But he's carried the cross in every country of the world. He hasn't been across every country because uh, like, uh, like Iran and some of those places, he's just able to get in- inside just a little bit. But, I mean, he's carried the cross in the snow and difficult times, war times, and different things like that. He said, after he went across the United States, he, uh, his first overseas trip was to Northern Ireland. And that's when Northern Ireland was involved in just huge, huge Civil War kind of stuff. And he's carrying the cross. He's got a 12-foot cross, guys. John made me one. I, I was wanting to kind of preach about this one time. John made me one. I still got it. And he was, he was carrying this cross to Northern Ireland. And he came up across a group of just real tough-looking guys. And they said, um, you can't go any further. And he said, well, yeah, God's called me to call, carry the cross through here. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to come on through here. And they said, no, if you go to that next street, we're going to take you. We're going to nail you to that cross you're carrying. And the uh, author said, well, gosh, y'all don't understand. I, I'm, I'm a man of peace. I just come here. I'm just carrying the cross. All I'm doing is carrying the cross. I want to tell people Jesus loves them. And uh, God's, called, God's called me to do this. So, so. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and you're just going to have to do what you're going to have to do. And they said, do you understand what we're saying to you? And he said, they had nails and a hammer. They wasn't like an idle threat. He said, we're going to, we're going to kill you if you go there. And uh, he said, guys, and John just seen a little bit. There's a movie. He's got a movie out called The Cross. It's on YouTube. You can watch it for free on YouTube. It's fantastic. I mean, it's a documentary, but I love the movie. And Arthur said, guys, you don't have to live this way. You don't. You really don't. And he had some little red stickers, little children's stickers. And he started peeling these little red stickers saying, Jesus loves you. And he started sticking them on these guys. He said, guys, Jesus loves you. You don't have to live with this anger. You don't have to live with this hate. Look, guys, y'all can kneel down right here and pray. And God will give you a new life. Well, come on, guys. Why don't you kneel down with me right here, right now, and let's pray. And you give your life to Jesus. Say, oh, man, go on. Get out of here. Just go on through. Just go on through. And Arthur said, <laughs> Arthur said, at the very beginning of the crosswalk, this is what he decided. God, I'm okay dying inside your will. I'm not okay living outside of it. I'm okay. If obeying you means I die, then I'm okay with that. But I am not okay disobeying you and living outside of your will. I'm just not. I'd rather, it's what is a direct quote. I'd rather die in the will of God than live outside of it. You know, something kind of funny here. I don't, you, I don't you look, if you will, here in, in Acts chapter 5, because there's such irony here. Look at Acts chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Um, the Bible says, But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, Go, stand and speak to the people of the temple the whole message upon this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak, began to teach. Then when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together. Even all the senate of the sons of Israel sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought out. I love the irony here. The irony here is several things. Number one, the Sadducees don't believe in angels, and an angel got them out of jail. Secondly, they're sitting around talking about what to do with the prisoners that they don't have. <laughs> Thirdly, they go to get them out, and they don't know where they are, <laughs> okay? I would have hated to been that guy, wouldn't you? All right, go get them, bring them here. So you, somebody had to go back, and uh, where are they? See, that's the thing. <laughs> if 
funny thing <laughs> that you'd say that. Um, see, the doors were locked. They're not in there. Sure. Oh, yeah, we're sure. <laughs> we looked hard as we could look, and then somebody else comes in and says, I, I hate to say this. Uh, they're back out there teaching again. <laughs> I mean, it's, it really is kind of a goofy thing, but, it, but it, it's kind of how ridiculous we can be when we say, I'm afraid of what you might think instead of obeying the God who loves me more than anybody in the whole world. So let me mention one last thing and we'll be done. And that is, if you're going to be unhindered from fear, you've got to release the outcome to God. Because here's the thing. If you're afraid of what somebody might say, they may say something bad about you. If you're afraid of rejection, you might get rejected. If you're afraid people might think you're weird, they might think you're weird. Uh, those things may happen. Most of the things that we're afraid of may, may not happen, but they, but they may happen. Here's the thing. you just got to release the outcome to God and trust God that he knows what he's doing. Look at verse 20 again. Here's what I want you to see tonight. Verse 20. This is what I want to get in on. Go stand and speak to the people of the temple the whole message of this what? Life. Not rules, not religion, not commandments, life. Jesus came to give life. And when we give in to fear, we're robbing ourselves of life. Jesus wants to give life. And if you're resolved, I'm going to obey God. He's got the outcome. And just let God do what God wants to do. One of the first overseas mission trips that, um, that I took uh, was to Venezuela. Me and Laura and uh, Richard Collier and a guy named Mike Bush. Uh, we felt led to go there. It was um, a huge trip out of Alabama. They were asking churches to send uh, teams of four to Venezuela to do revivals and door-to-door -door witnessing and things like that. And guys, <laughs> leading up to that trip, it was horrid, to be honest with you. Richard's dad died about two weeks uh, before we left. Uh, Mike had been training to be a, a, a firefighter, and uh, his interview was on the Monday we we're going to be gone. Um, my mom uh, had serious back surgery, and uh, we left her in a rehab center in New Orleans, uh, headed to the airport, and we buried uh, Laura's mom nine days before we left. So that's our four-member team. And we left my mom, and we drove back. I mean, we had just been, Laura's mom lived in California, died suddenly. We weren't expecting it at all. She just, we just got a call one day and said, said she'd passed away. And so, as I said, all that's going on. And I remember us driving to the airport in Mobile from Baton Rouge, from New Orleans. And I told Laura, I said, sweetheart, if you don't want to go, we won't go. I said, I, I'll, the money's fine. We'll just, we'll just eat the money. Um, I'll take the heat for it, you know, any embarrassment comes our way, I'll be glad to take that. But sweetheart, if you don't want to go, we don't have to go. I said, but what do you think God wants us to do? She said, I know what God wants us to do. God wants us to go. I said, all right, we'll go then. And I, and I felt the same way. I felt the same way. Uh, Y'all, it was one of the best trips of our lives. I cannot tell y'all how much we laughed on that trip. Oh, by the way, Laura's four months pregnant. <laughs> Ankles about yay big around. And um, before we went, it was hot. Okay? It's hot. Laura was actually, she was in a, I think it was a Lifeway bookstore in Birmingham. And she kind of, my wife will talk to anybody, okay? And she got in a conversation with somebody, found they were a missionary to South America. And they said, and she said, we're going on a mission trip to Venezuela. And they said, what city? And she said, Maracaibo. They said, the armpit of South America. Two different people in two different places at two different times told us that's the armpit of South America. It was so stinking hot. I don't know what to do. And we couldn't sleep at night. It was too hot. They have no air conditioning, oscillating fan. They had a dog that barked all night. <laughs> we got up in the morning and we got ready to go out. And that dog was asleep out there by the car. And I looked around. I didn't see that preacher anywhere. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and that dog jumped up and run. Laura said, what are you doing? She started hitting, quit it, quit it, what are you doing? I said, that rascal ain't going to sleep all day and keep me up all night. <laughs> Forget that racket now. <laughs> Y'all, we laughed. We, has, we led more people to Christ on that mission trip than any other mission trip I've been on. And I would have to say, out of all the trips Laura and I have taken, and I'm talking about just about vacation, about anything, I don't know that that would be the one we would not give up unless it was something to do with, with Hannah Grace and Joel. It was the one 
that we were most afraid of. It was one that we really didn't want to do, to be honest with you. But we knew God wanted us to do it. And so we just said, Lord, yes. And when you do that and you release the outcome to God, you just don't know what God might do. But you just have to trust him in it. Would you stand please with heads bowed and eyes closed? Heads bowed and eyes closed.